So we've been here for about seven seasons and we've really started to settle in. But what I wanted to concentrate on today are the different tactics that we're using in order to attract wildlife. So bird life, animal life, bug life to the gardens. And we started to put in quite a few gardens now. There's still quite a lot to do. One of the first things that comes to mind is bird feeders. And typically we have more bird feeders during the fall and the winter months, less in the spring and summer, but I can't help myself because I really like birds and I like observing birds. And obviously different ones in the spring and summer come during than the fall and winter. But we have different types of feeders. So you could see in the distance here, a tube feeder, which some birds are inhabiting. And then we have a platform feeder and we also have a jelly feeder. And the jelly feeders are particularly good for robins, Baltimore Orioles, cedar waxwings, all of those birds that we, we actually have here. And you can see, I actually filled this up with uh, lignin berries and it's pretty much eaten because these were up to the top. Sometimes you'll find a pollinator on there too, which is nice to see, like a little bee. I find that a lot of folks say that grape jelly is like the best jelly to put in your seed feeder or your jelly feeder, but that hasn't been my experience and I'm really tempted to actually uh, uh, do all types of, there's a hummingbird right there now, <laughs> and I'll show you why. There's a hummingbird feeder in there, so he's getting very territorial about that particular tree. But I, I'd love to actually do a jelly test to see what jellies the birds are attracted to because I've put out um, several in there and it seems like the lignin berry, which is like a nice natural tart but sweet berry, nothing that's too sweet, has been the preferred jelly by the birds here. Again, another interesting thing to note. Here's a hummingbird feeder. So that's something that we definitely keep out and we know when the hummingbirds are starting to come during the early part of May and a lot of things are not in bloom during May. We're trying to change that, but this gives them an opportunity to have some food really early in the season. I mean, we had snow up through May, so it could be really harsh for some birds. In the hummingbird feeder, we use a 100% undyed natural sucrose solution, which mixes easily. We just use two scoops of sucrose to one cup of water and find that's enough to last about a week and then we'll clean out the feeder and refill on a weekly schedule. The other thing I would say is having nesting materials. So we have some of these nesting materials kind of hanging up for birds to take. This might not be as relevant in the country, but I have nesting materials that I hang up in Brooklyn and oh my goodness, those things are gone by the end of the nesting season. So birds will use that in order to take in and incorporate within their nests or nest boxes. And that's another thing that I would uh, make note of is nest boxes. We've put up, oh my goodness, somewhere between 14 and 20 nest boxes this season. So I'll come and take you to show you that. So you can see the tree swallow actually in the nest box. And not all birds nest in boxes, but there's so many birds that are actual cavity nesters. So you could see your, your black capped chickadees, your tree swallows, and they, they might actually use that box for the whole season and come back season after season. So that's a great example of a box that we had there and it was 
really disheveled, it was coming apart. You should clean them out every year. And that was one of the things that we, we did actually in, the, in February before the birds actually came in here and scouted out their boxes. We started to put up those boxes, including these ones for the, our resident tree swallows right there. Even though you may want to clear out all of the dead trees from your backyard, it's also good to leave trees with holes and hollows for cavity nesting birds and animals. This gives them a natural space to raise their young or stay protected during the winter months. And not all birds are cavity nesters. Having protected overhangs can attract nest building birds like Phoebes, barn swallows, and robins, for instance. So the next items that we started to put in are bird baths. And we're trying to use like really organic shapes, stones, things along those lines in order to provide birds a water source all year round. Now this does freeze during the winter months. We actually bought one that plugs in and that heats up. We haven't really used that one as much, but the birds love it. This is a bit out of our scope right here, this bird bath, but we see birds in the distance actually use it. And I tried to plant plants that are a bit more like privacy shade for the, for the birds, but I'll show you some others. example of moving water for birds. Now this is pretty simple. It's just a solar powered water pump. So the solar panel is down below and I just covered it with terracotta pot so you don't see the pump because I thought well the pump looks a little weird sticking out of there. But birds love this bath. I mean we got blue jays, we got song sparrows, we have the robins absolutely adore taking baths. I mean, out of all the bath taking birds, American robins definitely steal the cake. And then it's the st song sparrows. And I just get a total kick out of them uh, washing up. And we have tons of robins here. I mean, some of our robins are putting out three or four broods this year. So I can tell that they're really happy. This is actually another watering vessel. And this is a low lying vessel and I have some stones in it because also what likes to drink water is butterflies and insects. And so when you have these river stones that have these natural indentations with little water or a little dew or a little early rain in the morning, this is a perfect little watering hole for a little beast. And I have seen birds actually using this too. So it's, it's one of those things that you offer them a diversity of places in order to be able to, to have, a, have a drink, especially during those hot days. The other thing that we started to do is just adding these kind of live edge wood pieces. So these are things that we just found in the forest. Now, I guess a tree had fallen and some of the roots had gotten stuck up into another tree. So this is one of the things that I had asked you to, to cut out of the tree and just start to use these in the garden. And so many animals use these. I found toads 
under here and if, you know, so they provide like a natural toad home. I figured this is probably going to be the best way for insects like solitary bees to actually find homes and crooks and crannies in there. I always see the, the American robins setting up on like the tops of these, just looking out and surveying the land or pooping and preening and doing all the things that birds do, beak wiping. Stacked wood is also a good space for insects and animals such as mason bees and chipmunks respectively. So in addition to the water and the bird homes and everything like that, we have these little feeders. And these typically would be maybe bird feeders, but because I have them so close to the ground, they actually turn out to be chipmunk feeders. So I'll show you another version of that over here. They're like little chipmunk gnome homes. Oh, it just zippy. jumped out of it. Zippy. So. <laughs> well, you loaded it with seeds in there. Yeah. That's why. So this is another chipmunk space where it's protected. He could run in there. I have a lot of like herbaceous plants around as well, so they could quickly hide for cover. We did see our neighbor's cat come out today. And so that's another thing. If you want wildlife in your garden, keep your cats inside. <laughs> Please, it's one of the top reasons why birds are getting killed in addition to bird strike, window strikes. So those are the things that you have to be cautious of as well. But that's a little chipmunk feeding station. And I even have a little watering dish back there for the chipmunks because I know that that's their path that they use to come in. We have a butterfly home. I haven't seen any butterflies or moths in it. Maybe it's not positioned as nicely, but this is an example here. And oftentimes butterflies or moths, when it gets a little cold or windy out, they can't fly around and they need protection. So oftentimes they'll go into little slots in trees or you know, under, underneath the, the bark of a hickory, shagbark hickory, for instance. So this is just an example of a butterfly home and we have some pollinator plants here for the butterflies. And so that you try to position it around a place where you have pollinator plants for your butterflies so that they realize that there's something there. Now on the topic of bug homes, I'll show you something else. So this is an example of a mason bee house and you could see that it's already being in use. So what they do is, these, these are solitary bees. These are native solitary bees that use mud. So it's important to have something like of a muddy material down here for them to use. And they'll use the mud and they'll actually, you know, create their little homes there. Now, this is a example of a mason bee house where it has these plexiglass covers on the outside. So if you wanted to see some mason bees, you could actually do that as well. So something like this, like a mason bee house like this is also fun for children. If you have children and you want to get them interested and involved in wildlife viewing and everything along those lines, especially the small insignificant creatures that make such an impact in life, then that's a great example of something that you could do. And I actually picked this one up. I really love this Mason Bee Home. There's so many different easy ones that you could do. This one seemed really beautiful and I picked this one up off of an Etsy shop and I'll leave the link there because uh, that gentleman has done such a wonderful job in creating a Mason Bee Home for the garden. This is our pollinator garden. And this is a bed that hopefully will give flowers all year round. I see one of our bumblebees have just actually flown on the scabiosa right here, this purple plant. And it's really interesting to see what the uh, pollinators are attracted to. And obviously different pollinators are attracted to different flowers. So we have right now close to 180 different varieties of plants in here. And not all of them have big, beautiful flowers. You know, some of them are um, a bit more like these gr tall grasses, which have a uh, less a showy inflorescence, but not in the, a showy kind of manner as some of these other bright, brilliant flowers. But the herbaceous grasses also provide coverage. And in addition to having pollinator plants for pollinators, it's also important to have some coverage plants. So as some of these plants grow up, they'll actually provide cover around the watering hole. But having shrubs, big shrubs, like this rhododendron, or like this 
Acer, Palmatum, Tamukayama. These are coverage plants. Even this Picea abies, I mean, our chipmunk would agree that this is a coverage plant. He could, he or she can run under here for protection against like a kitty cat who might be coming. And we always see even in the winter, even though this loses its leaves, the branches do, do provide um, a, a sort of respite and protection for our juncos, our darker juncos are always in this tree. Maybe not in the spring and summer, but definitely in the fall and the winter months. So providing coverage plants and not just like tiny plants are gonna be great for a lot of your wildlife and bug life and bird life. Okay, one of the other things that we started to use, and I realized that a lot of animals actually use stones. So this was just like a more decorative item. So we wanted to create like this dry riverbed type of look, but lots of animals use stones and we have tons of snakes around here. And I know when I mention the word snakes, people's skin is going to crawl, but at the end of the day, we love snakes and they're really great vermin control. So for instance, we have a lot of voles around here. I always describe them as a cross between a mouse and a mole, but they will girdle your trees, they will eat the roots of your plants. And if you use a lot of mulch in your beds, then they love that. It's a really good space for voles, unfortunately. And, um, and it, the stones actually really attract your herps. So sometimes if you have uh, stone little homes, toads and frogs will hide under there. They're great for a different kind of protection against like mosquitoes, for instance. And then you have your snakes, which will, would love on a hot sunny day just to come out and just lay on the stones in a protected place. So those are something, that, that's something that like we inadvertently did, but didn't think it would actually attract things like that. Mulch piles also, we have some mulch and we have our compost piles over there. There's often times where I'm actually forking out some of the mulch or the compost and boom, out pops a toad or boom, out pops a snake. Um, it could take your breath away a little, a little bit, but I'm generally not afraid of uh, snakes or other um, herps like that. So it's, it's kind of fun to actually see them. And I think it's also because that mulch is a dark color. It's natural wood mulch. It's a dark chestnutty brown. It heats up. It's also the bacteria on the inside, if it's a, in aerobic condition, will start to heat up naturally and it becomes like a little spa for our creatures. So that's something to really take into consideration. Another thing on the plant part is we talked about and touched upon pollinator plants, right? Like this Achillea, for instance. But other plants that are also very important, especially as the season starts to wane, is seed, fruit, and nut-bearing plants. And that's actually something that we're really working on now. We're looking at plants that not only provide fruit and interest all year round, but also nuts and seeds that wouldn't just be for us, but would also be for birds. When we first installed this pollinator bed, back in September of October of last year, we realized like during the winter months, so it was a September, October, it was fall. So it was already kind of a waning season. There is a lot of plants that went to seed here. And we realized when just like looking out the window that a lot of our songbirds were actually eating the seed heads. So that becomes an important food source for birds during that season, especially if you're in the cold season. In this bed, which we just started to plant up, I wanted to make an effort to have not only flowers all season long from basically April through uh, October, but also to have new, new fruit bearing plants. So this uh, Prunus pumula var depressa, it's a variation called depressa, it's a prostrate sand cherry. This will produce fruits. This uh, vaccinium right here will produce uh, fruits. And then we have some Lanicera in here that will also provide fruits. The Cornus canadensis will also provide fruits. The Aronia, that's going to give fruits off. So these are all gonna be important, basically trail mix for, for the birds during all different seasons. And I cannot emphasize that enough because we had a very late winter this year. We were having really heavy snows through May. The robins were here and they were literally picking the dried berries off of Ilex verticillata, which is the winter berry. It's called winter berry for a reason. And I know that's famine food because no other creature actually touched 
that berry until they really needed it. And when you also start to see your robins at your feeders during a really uh, pressure, uh, pressure time, like a time like that, that provides a lot of stress and pressure, then you know that they actually probably need a little of a, a helping hand. Sure, they'll be able to get by, but it's also nice to be able to provide something within your landscape that provides food, not just for you, but for the creatures that are around you. When we talk about planting native plants, we don't often emphasize why they're important. And one of the things that's often not discussed is insect host plants. So sometimes when something eats your plants, you get angry and you're like, why is something eating my plants? I have holes in my leaves, it doesn't look beautiful. Um, you know, a cherry trees, for example, prunus is a really great example that there, there's a lot of insects that use prunus as a host species. So when you see a prunus or, or like a, a cherry or a plum or something like that in the landscape, it often has a lot of insects on it. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because if you think about it, the vast majority of our birds are insectivorous and they need hundreds if not thousands of caterpillars in a day in order to feed their broods. So if you're not providing that in the landscape, if you're providing all exotic species that your wildlife doesn't understand or that your bug life doesn't understand, then you're not going to have that diversity in your landscape. So even this Prunus pumila, um, it's not really eaten up here. I mean, you do see some holes in it, but out in the orchard, it's not as close to home, those have gotten completely defoliated and now they're pushing out another set of leaves. So I think these plants have become really accustomed to a, a lot of pressure. Oaks are another great example. You know, a white oak, for example, is one of the most important trees in our landscape. If you look at the variety of organisms, I think rely on an oak for its food source whether that is the leaves or whether that is the acorns or whether that's you know using it as a space to inhabit, that's a really important tree. So when you start to select different herbaceous plants or grasses or sedges or trees or shrubs in your landscape, think about what's actually native there. And in fact, some of the research said, has said that even certain ornamental plants plants that have been cultivated or selected. So a great example of like an Achillea, this is not a native plant, for example, but it is a pollinator plant. And generally Achillea millifolium is, has a white flower, but they've also found at least at Mount Cuba Center that some of these plants will actually still provide a rich pollinator source, but it really is a, on a plant by plant basis. But what I'm talking about is more as an insect host plant, and that is something that we're working on and researching here. We're looking at native species that may have been here and actually bringing them back and seeing if certain plants actually have an interesting insect uh, connection. For instance, we have this native hookera. So we have hookera americana and we have hookera villosa, and it happens to be that the hookera americana has a, a deep partnership with a, a bee called a cellophane bee. And you don't find that cellophane bee unless you find Hookera americana. And a lot of the Hookera americana has gone away. And so we're actually getting quite a bit of Hookera americana and we're going to start planting it within our landscape. And we'll see if we could find something like the cellophane bee coming back. So that just gives you a great example of um, the partnerships that plants and insects and other wildlife can play within the web of life. All right, so I'm bringing this out. This is something that we haven't employed yet here at Flock, but this is a bat house. So if you have a lot of mosquitoes or insect pressures, then bats are something that you'd actually want to have in your landscape. And part of the reason why we haven't hung this up yet is that we actually have to refinish the sides of the barns and the house and everything along those lines. So we wouldn't want to have to hang this up and then take it down. So it's one of those things that eventually we'll have these in the landscape. I have seen bats in the landscape. We have a lot of shagbark hickory. So I can imagine that one of the common places that they, um, 
that they're hosted at night is underneath the, the bark of the shag bark hickory, especially solitary bats. So that's something that is really important. But I know these work. I mean, I was up in Maine. My aunt and uncle had a house up there. And when I was like 12 years old, I went up there and it was just really wonderful piece of nature. And there were so many bats in this old 1700s house. And I have to say, it was kind of scary at night because they were flying all over. But they immediately put bat houses on the side of their house and all the bats went to the bat house, which is pretty amazing. So they do really work. So a great example of creating habitat in your space for wildlife is a pond. Now this is a, a pretty grand pond, but so many of our animals actually use this. You know, this is a nice little grade into the pond, so it's not something that they'd fall in. I mean, a lot of our birds use this, but some of the insect, the birds on wing. So we see kingbirds, we see tree swallows, we see barn swallows that like to fly over this space and basically catch insects. But you have other creatures in here, a lot of aquatic insects. So you see dragonflies and damselflies, whirligig beetles, uh, crane flies, mayflies. Uh, what else do you see? Stoneflies. There's so many things that you could actually find in here. And we, you, you see that we actually keep this kind of natural border. So we have lots of carrots and juncus, like all, of, all these sedges, lots of different wildflowers and everything along those lines. And this provides a nice carpet and tapestry for a host of wildlife. So if you could create little ponds, it doesn't have to be a big pond, it could be the size of a small bird bath, then those are things that creatures will absolutely love. Early in the season, in the spring and throughout the summer, the frog song is just so sonorous. We have green frogs and we have uh, spring peepers and American toads and tree frogs and bullfrogs, like so many others. And it's just so melodious, you know, through the, through the seasons. And I, you know it's really spring when you hear, hear the spring peepers. So seeing frogs and toads in the landscape, knowing that they're actually using these ponds and little wet areas is really important. One of the things that I think that we're looking to achieve in an area like this is during the springtime, we do get a lot of ducks. Um, and also in the migrations, we get a lot of um, uh, water birds. They try to attempt to use our duck houses because we do we have assembled some duck houses, but I think we have a lot of predator pressure here. And one of our wood ducks was using a, a duck box and we saw claw marks on it and there was no more wood ducks. I think they either flew away, hopefully they escaped and they found another place elsewhere in order to have their, their babies. But we usually never see baby ducks on this pond and we really like any suggestions whatsoever how to create the best predator proof duck boxes, whether that's from raccoons or uh, other creatures. I mean, we see, we have pine martens here as well, or we have martens and we, and we have all those types of creatures that want to eat a duck. So if you have examples of really good predator proof duck boxes, please let us know in the comments below because that is something that we would really like to achieve here and that we're trying to achieve. I'd say the last thing um, that you could really do to attract wildlife to your area and this is this is something that again we're continually working on here is just adding biodiversity and unique spaces so we have spaces that have a lot of stone coverage for animals like killdeer like our, our resident killdeer we have tall grass for our goldfinches and our red-winged blackbirds we have native areas, so there's a diversity of landscapes, but we also want to add a diversity of plants as well. So it's not just about pollinator plants, it's not just about insect host plants. There may be things out there that we don't even know or that we haven't uncovered yet, but by introducing some of those native plants 
back into the, the wild or allowing them to grow in the wild and to come up and to actually reach their full potential, whether that's as an inflorescence or, or what have you, then you're going to start to enrich yourself with many different wildlife, whether that's bug life or bird life or animal life. Ooh, that's a great blue heron. He's being chased by <laughs> other birds. Too. Yeah. That, so oftentimes our great blue heron is interrogated by our red-winged blackbirds because the red-winged blackbirds have their nests around the pond area and those, they shouldn't feel like they're threatened by the great blue heron, but it is a formidable bird and the great blue heron actually fishes out the fish in the pond. So, you know, just goes to show you all the different ways that wildlife interacts with one another and interacts with your landscape. And you have, you're enriched by all the sightings that you see as well. So hopefully that gives you a bunch of ideas to attract wildlife to your garden. And of course, the more that you could do naturally in your space, then you could probably start taking out those bird feeders and the bird baths if you actually, you know, create spaces like this within your habitat. If you have suggestions on attracting birds and other wildlife to your backyard and gardens, do share them in the comments below for all viewers to consider. And consider liking, subscribing, tipping, and hitting the notifications button if you find value in these videos. We're actually reinvesting 10% of our Google AdSense revenue back into the community here, so your support as a viewer is appreciated. We'll see you in the next video.